you're seated in the presence of the Lord, we, we have started this moment, the first Sunday in December, to be a part or to start, if you will, the next uh, few weeks or so as we move into the end of the year to crystallize your talent, your gift, your vision, your passion, and to galvanize you into and to galvanize, to, to, to arrest you into the army of the Lord, to recruit you into the army of the Lord. You say, what does that mean, Bishop? That means that we're getting ready to go to war, that we have been in training a very long time, but now we must, we must now see if our gifts work. We must now test the anointings. We must now put to work the, the gifts of the spirit in our lives that we can no longer just be in training but we must now be engaged and deployed if in fact the Lord Jesus is coming back and how many of you believe that he is then he wants to find you working he wants to find you engaged he wants to find us doing something that is changing the world he wants to make sure that Everything that you have received is not in vain. Hallelujah. I was reading a scripture the other day from Paul's talk to the Galatians when they were trying to confuse the law with grace. They were trying to confuse circumcision with baptism and getting it all messed up. You know, the Galatians had problems. And Paul said, why would you frustrate the grace of God? That scripture just spoke to me in a way it had not spoke to me before that we have received such grace. But if we, if, we, if we don't put to work the things in which we have received, it is a frustration to the grace of God. I don't want to frustrate God's grace. It's such a wonderful gift. It's such a marvelous gift to us. I don't want to frustrate the grace of God by constantly receiving and never doing, never giving, never producing anything. <laughs> That's the apple of my eye right there, okay? <laughs> that we that we are that we are really being the church, not just members but we are investing in the church. Is that all right? I want you to just look at a couple of scriptures for us. Thank you uh, to our ministry uh, team of music and worship leaders, uh, uh, Pastor Shelton, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> amen. Amen. The minstrel Robinson, praise God. And of course, our worship leader and psalmist, Sister Ruth Sinclair. I want you to look at a scripture for just a moment in Matthew's gospel, chapter 25. And uh, we are going to be walking this out for the next three or four weeks until we get to the first of the year. And by January, I pray that we will have heard from you and you've heard from us and we will have a plan that we can implement. Amen. We are working from the perspective or the subject that the next big is small. Say that with me. The next big is small. Let me just make an announcement, and maybe you haven't heard it yet, but the mega church trend has come to an end. The mega church trend has come to an end. Now, what does that mean, Bishop? That simply means that what we saw in the last 20 years or so, I think the first mega church was really longer than that, was actually D.L. Moody over in Chicago, uh, that was probably in the uh, early 1900s, he was now recorded as having the first mega church. And since that time, we have seen a trend, maybe the last 100 years or so, of churches growing beyond 500. The average church in America is literally 75 members. That is the median size of a local church. And that has nothing to do with denomination or anything. That's just what church looks like in America. 
the last 30 years or so, we saw churches grow to 300, 500, 2,000. Then we began to see this a model where it was one church in multiple locations. And so that, that, that set a precedent, if you will, of church growth that if in fact you were supposed to be a legitimate church, you needed several campuses. And that, that, that is not the norm, believe it or not. The average church in America is 75, and there are less than 100 churches that are 5,000 or more. I need you to hear facts. I need you to hear the data. And so could it be that some of our aspiration uh, was just culturally uh, motivated and not necessarily biblically motivated? Amen. And so we began to see this model of growth, 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 growth. But it's not necessarily the model that is the biblical model. And so trends don't last. Trends come and trends go. And it was great in terms of it being, uh, you know, certainly people coming to Christ, coming to church. It was great for that. But the pandemic just kind of put an end to it. It was already ending. It was already on the decline for probably the last 10 years. But the pandemic has really proved that it has come to an end. There may be some larger, wealthier churches that still have some semblance or mo uh, momentum in that arena, but that's not going to be the norm in the next 30 years. So the next big is small. I said three years ago, one morning, we were doing, it wasn't Pentecost in the pandemic, it was 40 days to Pentecost. And I said by the Spirit, and I was very stunned that I said it, that the small church will be popular again. And I was stunned when I said it. I was almost embarrassed that I said it. Now, if you ever have been a person that gives the word of the Lord and it's so spontaneous, many times it comes out of your mouth before it comes to your head. And so as you're prophesying a word or you're giving a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and you give a word, many times it slips out of your mouth and you have to go back and rethink that. Like, is that really what I said? Because that didn't come from you, it came from God. The small church will be popular again. That was three years ago. That was like 2018, 2019. And then the pandemic hit. And the devil put a spirit of fear on the people of God. The people of God started walking in a spirit of fear. The spirit of fear hit the church so... I want to say this, and I don't want to, I don't want to in any way minimize the fact that we've lost people, but the Spirit of the Lord moved on people in such a way that I believe the pandemic did not do as much damage as the spirit of fear did. There was a lot of death in COVID, and still there's death. But what died from fear? See, because once you died and we bear it, and we grieve you and we move on, but the spirit of fear hit the church. And the one entity that should have been stalwart and bold and courageous in the midst of a pandemic was the one entity that the devil found a way to shut down. Now, did anything good come out of it? Absolutely. We found the virtual world to be our friend and our ally. We were able to transition or pivot, if you will, to a virtual model of the local church. And certainly there, the gospel didn't stop being preached. But church attendance declined. And it declined as it was already declining, but it declined and spiraled so quickly. And then each wave of COVID each wave, each wave of the pandemic literally just kept more and more impact coming at the church. 
So now the Lord says, the next big is small. Now, as a pastor, as a senior pastor, one of the things that I, I don't like about this job is that things just keep changing. You know, like 1985, 86, when I first started pastoring, I was clear, 9335 three, Alger, I was good. You know, and, and we, we, we were good. And then we went to, uh, what, Northwest Activity Center, I think? And I, and I was good. And then we, you know, we came here. We had a community. We had 1,500 homes that had people in it in one square mile. One square mile, and then we moved into the community. So we had residents, we had people we could work with, we went to the shelters, we were good. <laughs> and we were evangelizing and doing all kinds of wonderful things. We were good. And then it changed again. That's the one thing that I don't like about my job is that it keeps changing. And when the landscape changes, you have to change. When the culture changes, you have to change. Now, finding where that change is and landing uh, this time is going to depend a lot on us and our conversations together. But it has changed. So when, when, when we first heard in 1986 or so that Holy Ghost uh, Baptist, Full Gospel Baptist Church is a family church, 3,000 strong, 1,000 men, 1,000 women, 1,000 children. We were excited because we were probably about 30 people at that time. And so that was our reach. That was before us as the mantra. That was the drive. That's what we were going for. 3,000 strong, 1,000 men, 1,000 women, 1,000 children to the glory of God. And God was doing it at such rates that really it was hard to keep up with. And even when we would look around in this house, young couples with children and the balconies, you know, jam-packed and money and flowing and missions and, you know, there was just so much going on. Evangelism was our supreme task. We made sure that we were knocking on doors, but we had doors to knock on. <laughs> it's hard to go out evangelizing when there's no residents. It's no, it's nobody uh, in, in the house, in no house. Now we just got a lot of land. The last time we did a, 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 some data research in this community, we had less than, I've got some echo out here. We had less than 600 people in three square miles. Now you gotta hear this. We, when we started, we were 1,500 people in one square mile, one square mile of this address. And the, and the last time we did it probably was about 10 years ago. We were 600 people in three square miles. So from here to Gratiot, back around, and that's three square miles. 600. And I'm sure now it's probably less than that just because of the change of the community. So, so, so now people can watch us online, people can watch us uh, virtually from all over the country. And through the pandemic, we were more than 3,000 strong. We were sometimes 7,000, 8,000, just in people hearing the word of God. But then time, time now is that we must reassemble. And of course, you know, other churches started opening up and other churches, of course, began to do the things that we were doing to get their people back into the, into the house. And still there's, the, the, the data says, there's still about 43% of church going people prior to the pandemic that still have not returned to the local church. So, so, so what is the next big small? The next big is small. The next big is not 3,000 strong. That cannot be our goal now. 
The culture has changed. The climate has changed. The community has changed. So what is the next big? The next big is small. And what I sense in my heart is that if we will just become 120 strong. What does that mean? 120 strong. That's 120 in Sunday service. That's 120 at Bible study. That's 120 at prayer. That's 120 invested people. 120 strong. Now, 120 strong with each person finding their passion and doing ministry as God has put it in them as a gift. Now imagine what that will be. Now remember that before we got 3,000 in the book of Acts, you had 120. That it was 120 people that actually won 3,000. That it was actually 120 people that after the 3,000 were saved and baptized that actually won another 5,000. So I need you to understand the value of the small. The value of the small is that you can't be big without the small. Okay, I need somebody to hear what I'm saying. Somebody repeat that after me. You can't be big without the small. Amen. All you have to do is look at a baby. A baby will one day be a grown man. That man, he's so tall. I saw him walk over there. I said, wow, he's really tall. Sir, would you stand up for me? With the man with a pretty gray beard. Thank you so much. Now, how tall are you? You weren't born like that. Do you know how much you weighed when you were born? Did anybody ever tell you? But I, Long time. But one thing is for sure. When you came out of your mother's womb, you were small. But you're how tall now? But you couldn't have got six, seven if you probably wasn't about seven or eight pounds in the beginning. You agree? How many of you see that? Alan is three years old. And in another 10 years, he'll be 13. But when he first came to us, he was a teeny weeny baby. Are you listening to me? Hannah, a small bitty bitty baby, will one day be a grown woman. Or grown man. Now what am I, what is the point? You cannot be big without small. So instead of trying to be big and unsuccessful, let's be small and powerful. Let's be small and invested. All right? All right. Now, guess what happens when you're small? You have to be accountable. Because now every moving part must function as it has been ordained. When you're big, you can fake it. Because there's always going to be somebody to catch your job. You can hide out. But when you're 120 strong, every part must do its work. And you must be consistently doing it and doing it well. Is anybody here? All right, say, say it with me. The next big is small. Let's go to Matthew 25. And we're just talking. We're just talking today. Are you ready? All right, after a long time, verse 9, and I'm going to go back up just in case we are watching and reading. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven, verse 14, is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to his own ability. And immediately... He went on a journey. Now, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, I don't know which version you have, but would somebody else help me read verse 15 again? Everybody, if you can, let's read it together. What does it say? 
And to one he gave what? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. I want you to underline that. To every person, he gave gifts according to their ability. All right? So nobody, and I, I'm going to say this in Ebonics, nobody walked away without a gift. Everybody got a gift. Now, some got more than others, but everybody, all right? Now, I want to clear the air. One of the things that I know we did not do well was that after we got to a growth momentum, we stopped evangelizing. We didn't do that well. We didn't, we didn't do this well. Now imagine if eight people leave the church every year. Imagine if eight people stop coming to the church every year for whatever the reason. They die, they go to another church, or they just stop going to church. But imagine if a congregation of four or five hundred loses eight people every year and those eight people are never replaced. All right? How many of you just heard what I said? What happens when a church stops growing? A church stops growing because people are leaving and they're not being replaced. All right, nobody's saying nothing. I have uh, seven elders, seven leaders that sit with me. Imagine if each one of us won a soul, a disciple every year. That's seven new people every year. Not putting the pressure on nobody yet, but the leaders. Imagine if every elder had a convert every year, just one a year. Not five a month but just one a year that they were witnessing to, that they were discipling, and that they were following up with, and they were members of this church. So as people left, there would already be people coming in. Now imagine if all 300 did it. If 300 people won one soul a year, and they became a disciple in this house. As you lose eight people a year, but you got 300 people coming in. Imagine the numbers. Okay, nobody, nobody liking me. It's all about numbers, folks. This, this is not rocket science. It's numbers. Everybody, everybody playing numbers. Everybody's playing numbers. McDonald's playing numbers, Chick-fil-A is playing numbers, school boards are playing numbers. We all playing numbers. So what happens when a church and the individuals of that church stop using their gift? All right, so I want you to take out a piece of paper and write this down because I want to help you. And then we're going to get into a good dialogue. I want you to write down two words. And I want you to put in the piece of paper a line up the middle. On one side, you're going to write the word function. F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N. Function. On the right side of the paper at the top, you're going to write unction. U-N-C-T-I-O-N. All right? Now, if we was at Sesame Street, it would be Junction, but I don't, we're not doing Junction. Y'all had to be a certain age to understand function at the Junction. But we're not doing Junction today. We're not doing function or Junction, all right? We're going to do function and unction. So, I want to do that to help you find your, your gifts. 
Because I think what happens is we get committed to function and stop developing our unction. Okay. So function is just what we do, everybody who is doing something in the church to keep the church being the church. So you shovel the snow, you take videos, you run the sound, you run the lead, you lead the worship. That's your function. I'm the pastor. That's my function. Chief of operations, function. Trustee, function. All right? Hospitality, culinary, function. But that's not your unction. Over the last 30 years, one of my passions has been teaching on the Holy Spirit. But that's not my function. That's my unction. I need, I need, I need you to sit in that for a minute. So because you have ushered for 40 years, does not mean that you've ever functioned in your unction. It just means that you've been functioning. <laughs> Pastor Shannon comes in every Sunday and she makes sure communion is done and when I need her to preach, she's a phenomenal teacher, preacher. But that's her function. It's not her unction. My sister is an amazing psalmist. But that's her function. And so we like to really brag about our function. But we don't talk about our unction. Your unction is where that gift is. James Shelton is one of the most phenomenal musicians in the city of Detroit, state of Michigan. That's his function. Minister of music, pastor of worship, function. See, titles, you, you can find your function in your title. But that's not your unction. And your unction is what's going to attract and build and grow the church. I've been the pastor here for 36 years. I've grown this church at least 10 times just on my function. But what I've decided is I don't want to do that no more. I don't want to do it no more. And I don't think I should. Because what happens is, as I'm moving and growing and enlarging, and the church is growing, and people are coming here to preach it, you see, the rest of it is missing. So I can get them in the door. But I can't keep them. Because there's too much missing. Because you're sitting on your unction. It's quiet. So I can get 2,000 people to come for a Pentecost Sunday from all over the world. Because of my unction, teaching on the Holy Spirit, people want to have an experience with God. But they're looking for youth leaders because they got to bring their children. Or they're looking, looking for marriage ministry. Or they're looking for technology ministry. Or they're looking for outreach ministry. Or they're looking for something else. And it's missing. Because the rest of us are not operating in our true unction. And we want to be celebrated for our function. We want to be applauded for our function. But function doesn't grow the church. 
Function does not grow the kingdom. Unction grows it. So now this guy, he has these three guys that are working for him and he gives them, in this text it was money. He gives them talents, which is money in the text. So he gave one five. Now, watch what the text says. He gave it according to their ability. So there was already some type of proven track record. So he gave one five. He gave one two and he gave one one. But everybody got some. Now, the one with five, you begin to see why he gave them five. You know why? Because five, the one with the five already had the ability to multiply. The one with two already had been proven to be able to what? Multiply. Why did the one only get one? Because he had already been proven that he did not know how to multiply. But because I'm a God of grace, I'm not going to leave you out. I'm going to put something in your hand. Chief is going to help me. And this is called a spiritual gift tool to help you discover what your unctions are. Because when we start talking about what my unction is and how I'm going to function in my unction, you need to be clear what it is. And just in case you don't know, you will know. And when you get it in your hand and everybody gets one, let me know. Amen. Give it to the young people as well. Make sure all the young folks get it. Make sure, Sister Erica, your son gets one as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Make sure that, uh, that, absolutely. Now, there are about 96 questions in this book. It's all right. And between now and next week, your assignment is to take it home and to complete it. Amen? amen. Nobody said nothing. I said amen. Amen. What I do not want you to do is to try to look at the back and try to fit yourself into something that you really are not gifted in. I want you to do this purely and honestly by reading the front. I think we need some more over here. Pastor Shannon has her hand up. Anybody else that did not get one, please raise your hand. All right, good job. This is a very simple, simple thing to do. The questions start on page two. Do not look at the back and read the back before you do the questions. Why is MJ laughing? Because he know people be cheating. <laughs> because you don't want to be held accountable for what, you, what you're not gifted at. Because if you give this book back to me and I look at what you circled and I come to you and say, okay, this is what you circled. Now, and I say, okay, when you plan to implement this and you done cheated, you're going to be looking funny because you don't have the unction in that space. That's not where you're gifted. How many of you just heard what I just said? Do not look at the back. I see people already looking at the back. I'm looking at them. And they're doing it right in front of my face. <laughs> now, 
The instructions are in, on page one. Page one. All right? So you answer the 96 questions. You rate each one from zero to four. Zero isn't bad and four isn't good. So this is not a grading rubric in terms of you get an F if you get a zero or you get an A if you get a four. No, this is just your honest assessment of how you function, how you flow, how you move. Amen? Now, when you find a question with two or more parts and you rate any one as not true in your life, then mark the whole question with a low number. In other words, if you think part is true, but the other part is not, rate the whole question with a, a low number. All right? Now, at the end, you will add your numbers, and then you will go to the back and look at the gifts or the key to line up what it is that you have now completed. All right? This is not hard to do. This does not make you better than anybody else. It's just an assessment. And this is the tool that we're going to use to help you identify which gift or gifts you have been given. Now, one of the things that I do in my coaching business is that I start off with this question, and I'm going to start off with you. What problem were you born to solve? Write that down. What problem were you born to solve? Amen. Now, every person who is born was born because God needed you to solve a problem. The only reason that Adam was created is that God had a problem. Somebody tell me what was the problem. Talk back to me. What was the problem? Why was Adam even created? Okay, stand up, Sister Robinson, and speak in your mic. You have a mic. Why was Adam created? And don't say, you know, you know, don't don't give me the 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 the, the poem. And God was lonely and sat down and said, "I'll make me a man." <laughs> James Weldon is not in the Bible, all right? <laughs> Why was Adam created? To replenish the earth and um, to take care of the earth. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Why was Adam created? Yes? Oh, that's, that's good. Why was Adam created? Why was Eve created? Somebody tell me, why was Eve created? Y'all, Are y'all confident of these answers? Are you guessing? All right. So Adam was created to do what? To take care of God's creation. So God could create it, but he couldn't take care of it. No, no ma'am. He could not take care of it. Because God is spirit. Remember, God is spirit. So as, as powerful as he is, he can't cut grass. He can't hang blinds. He can't unpack boxes. He can't shovel snow. He is a creator. All right. But he needs mankind to steward or to oversee the work. Are y'all here? All right. Now he looks at Adam and says, uh, this ain't good. <laughs> this is good. Then he going to need a little auntie. <laughs> so... He wasn't necessarily created to replenish because he had nothing to replenish with. 
he had to have a replenisher. The other side of that is nasty. You can't, no matter whatever you do, you can't reproduce without help. So she was created with a solution. Adam was created with a solution. God creates nothing without a purpose. Now, watch this. Why were you created? You know how many people live their whole life and never know the answer to that? Never know the answer to why was I created? Now, how will I know why I was created? You're going to find out in this book why you were created. Okay, nobody excited but me. Now, you may have a job in education that's your function, but it doesn't mean that's your unction. So don't, uh, don't look for your unction and your function to be parallel all the time. My unction is very different than my function. I am a senior pastor. I am a bishop in the Lord's church. My gifting is that of the apostle. I am a leader. My gift is leadership. That is my function. But my unction, one of my giftings is my passion for Holy Spirit. There's no relationship between them. It's only a relationship because you know me. How many of you saw that? Can you see that? The only way you make it a relationship between the two is because you know me. And you know my function and my unction. But if you didn't know me, I could be teaching the Holy Spirit and not passing no church. I could be teaching the Holy Spirit and not be a bishop. My, my, my gift is leadership. That's my gift. That's one of my gifts. Romans chapter number 12. My gift is leadership. My spiritual gift is apostle. My function is bishop or pastor or elder. But my unction is what gets me up every morning at 4.30. And nobody has to call me and wake me up and remind me to do it. See, when you're in your unction, you don't need to be motivated. When I look at Pastor Valerie McCune, from the day she walked in my life, she has always had an unction for children. I don't have to ask her what she's doing. I don't have to ask her to do it. I don't have to motivate her. She wrote a whole dissertation about the power of the Holy Spirit in children. I have to do that because that's her unction. Now, her function is, if you saw her, is menstrual or Levite. I want you to see how sometimes they don't connect. She's, Le she's a Levite. She's a menstrual. That's her function in the body. But her unction is children. And when you're in your unction, nobody has to motivate you. Nobody has to call you and remind you to do it. Just because you're a man don't mean you have an unction for men's ministry. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you have an unction for women's ministry. Are you listening to me? Ooh, I'm teaching so good. Am I helping folks? Am I helping you? My sister is one of the greatest psalmists living. She is a Levite of Levites. But her unction is beautification, hospitality, decor. I'm telling you, I can't wait for her to get in this new house. See, they may not relate. So when you are doing your function in the house of God, you can't get satisfied 
until you produce your unction. And your unction is what fills the house with treasures. When everyone is functioning in their unction and unctioning in their function, the house has no lack. So you say, well, I, ooh, I really wish we had a single woman's ministry. Okay, that might be your unction. That might just be what you're supposed to put here. That might be something you say, I just wish we had a, 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 a something for children, for moms with, with, you know, single parents. You might be the person that God is speaking to. That might be one of your giftings. And what we normally do is we go out and complain or we go out and look for it in another place. We start church hopping and going back and forth, trying to look for what we look for, trying to find what we're looking for when we look at what we're looking for is in us. We can, we go all over everything on the internet. Uh, we, we in this church. We at that place. We at that. We all over everything. Look at what we, we ain't got this and we ain't got that. The reason it bothers you is because it's probably something you're supposed to produce. I had a young man to come to me and he said, I don't know why we don't have no men's ministry. I said, mm, I don't either. <laughs> It was Bernard Parker. I never will forget it. We're sitting upstairs in the hospitality room. And uh, he said, I, you know, I just have a problem because, you know, you're a woman and, you know, there's no man's ministry here. You don't even talk about the man. You don't look at the man. That was a lie, but <laughs> he really don't know me. But, <laughs> but <laughs> and I just sat there and I listened to him and I listened and I listened. And I said, Bernard, I'm, I'm going to do something. I just want you to look at me. So I stood up and I just turned around. And I just, I said, you, I want you to look at me. Look at me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Look at me. I said, what do you see? What do you, what do you mean? I see, the, I see, I see, Pastor C, I see, you know, a, a bishop. I said, I said, no, 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 no. Do you see the woman? Why would a woman Think of men's ministry. Well, I never thought about it like that. So guess what? I believe that God is speaking to you. Because it bothers you. It don't bother me. So here's a question. Write it down. What in this church bothers me. What in this church bothers me? Now you ain't got to ask nobody because you've already talked about it. You've already shared it with three or four people. Y'all have already had a conversation around dinner. You probably have had the conversation more than once. But what in this church bothers you? Because I'm going to say this, and I might be a little premature. It might be the area of your gift that you're not developing, that you're not nurturing, or you have not invested in. And the bothering, the irritation is the Holy Spirit trying to get you to do something about it. When I saw the schools and the shape that they were in, it bothered me. I didn't fuss about it. I didn't fight about it. I didn't go to the meetings and cuss the board out and cuss the superintendent out. I said, no, I need to do something about that. Because remember, one of my gifts is leadership. So what did I do? I put my name downtown on the ballot. And I got elected. And then I got reelected. You know why? Because it's one of my gift sets. It's to be in leadership and people in this town trust my leadership. Now I don't have to fuss about it. I can be about it. We want to fuss about it but don't want to be about it. 
All right. So let's just talk about the next big. The next big is what? Small. How many of you right now are just thinking your mind is already running about, okay, what is it? So I was talking to Nikki last night, and I said, Nikki, one of the things that I'm not going to do in this season is motivate people. Not going to do it. Every morning, I wake up, Brother Dove, at 4.15, 4.30. Even if I'm not going online, I'm woke. If there is a book out there on the Holy Spirit, I got it. When they packed up these books, there are at least 15 boxes of books. And all of those books are just about Holy Spirit. Because if you're going to be a pneumatologist, then you need content. And you need consistency. So I don't see seven, 8,000 people a day because I'm just cute with sparkly glasses on. They come for the content. But what does that cost me? What does it cost me to move in my gift, to move in my unction, to move in my passion? Everything. Time. I went back to school. I, 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 I went back to school just to learn from a, a, a biblical seminary perspective more about Holy Spirit. Who asks me to do that? Nobody. Who calls me every morning and wakes me up? Nobody. Who motivates me? Nobody. It's my unction. And coming up on three years in a few weeks. And I don't see an end to it yet. Because it's my passion. It's what bothers me. I grew up in a church that never talked about the Holy Spirit. I didn't know anything about Holy Spirit. And when I, when I started hearing about it, I said, well, if I'm a person that's never heard of it, how many other people have never heard of the Holy Spirit? And so for 40 plus years now, I've been teaching across the world on the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I've been reading and developing and creating curriculum. And, you know, you see me one hour on a, on, on a Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But that's hours of reading. That's hours of studying and preparing. That's homework. That's book reading. That's paper writing. That's, that's, that, that's writing on those discussion boards. That's reading because I'm, I've got to get the information so that I can teach it. When you know what your unction is, you will not need motivation. When you hit a dead spot, when you hit a dry spot, when you hit a moment where you feel discouraged or you feel tired or you feel like giving up, you won't quit because you can't quit yourself. Now, if I give you an assignment, you quit. If I make up something and give it to you, you get mad or you get tired or you get frustrated and you're going to write me a letter that I'm not going to read <laughs> and you're going to resign. And now the hope that we had for that part of the ministry is now again what? So now I am asking you to birth it. I'm asking you to spend time with this book I've given you and spend time with God and bring back some solutions. What do I want to see in this church? What ministry is missing? What have I seen in other places that I would like? Now, it may not even be ministry. It could be serving. It could be upgrading the technological systems here because one of the areas that we're going to have to build up is the virtual. We've got to build that because that's not going away. 
So you may have skill in technology. Maybe you're not a preacher. But you say, okay, I want to be the person that makes sure that our church has top-notch technology. I don't want to just make it ministry. I want to be the person. Brother Will came home, and I'm so glad he's back home. And he, came, he called me the other day and he said, I got to go back up to the church. And I said, well, where are you? He said, I went home. He said, but I'm using your campaign material as a tool for evangelism. I said, what? He said, is that all right? I said, of course. So he's taking the cards that we use for the election, but he's using it as a point of contact. For evangelism. I didn't tell him to do that. He didn't meet with me about that. But when is your unction? Ooh, I'm talking good. Am I talking good? I'm talking better than you shout. No. <laughs> what is my unction? What is my unction? What is my gift? Sister Loretta, she runs that, that table back there and, you know, she's turning in money for the anniversary and I can't wait to get there after church. But let me tell you, I cannot live without that lady. Her function is to make sure that, you know, we have money for the anniversary, right? But her unction is serving. Her unction is hospitality. Now, you all don't know that because you don't get to see it maybe in this space. But I could not have moved without her. You ought to praise God for that lady. Come on, don't sit there and be mad because I didn't call you. That ain't your unction. Somebody called me the other day and said, uh, Bishop, uh, do you need some help? I said, baby, are you good at... Uh, 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 at uh, unloading boxes and organization. Well, no, I just thought you needed something. I don't need no help. <laughs> the last thing, I, the last thing, baby, the last thing I need is for somebody to come and disorganize what's already disorganized. That's not a help. So April comes to the house and she's she's unloading boxes and she's putting stuff up, and I'm like, dang, this girl is good. Now, that's an, that's an unction. She's gifted in logistics. She's been in the military for 40 years, so she knows organization. Y'all not hearing this. Shannon came by the house. She said, Mama, what you cook? I said, my first meal. So she in there eating crab cakes and stir-fried cauliflower rice. And so I said, Pooh, where's the watering pot? For the, for the plants. She said, okay, I saw it. So she, she, went, she said, well, how much water? Now watch this. Watch this. See how different they are. So Prill says, how much water do I put on the plants? I said, well, whatever you put on one, put on the same. So then she says, Shannon. <laughs> Shannon's in there eating. She said, what? She said, okay, I got it. So unction. She loves farming. She loves being in the ground. All of our plants live when she touches it. She's organizing. She's horticulture. But her function is pastor. How do you think our lawn should look? You see, it's not always your function. It's the unction that's going to cost you some time. Ooh. See, your function you can do in two hours on a Sunday morning. But your unction is going to cost you some time and some investment. It's going to cost you some availability. So after she watered the plants, who is in there pulling boxes? She getting stuff out. I'm going through it. I'm trashing stuff. We working together, right? Chan says, well, all right, I had a time.
So who that crab cake show was good, mama? All right, I had a time, I'm out. Now watch this, so here's, here's something really, really, really special. Alan is very engaged, right? So Alan, Daryl comes over. Daryl runs sound, that's function, but that ain't his unction. His unction, his unction is gadgets, handyman, fixing, building. That's what his unction is. But his function is running that sound. So he comes over. He's doing things in the house, making sure I'm secure, making sure things are good. And Alan is picking up his little stool. And he's going all over the house, following him. And I said to Pooh, I said, look at him. That's his unction. See, long before we give you a function, you should know your unction. And what happens in church is you get so connected to your function, your title, that you forget your indigenous unction. Alan is not a bishop. He, is not, he, he doesn't have a title. He, he does, he's not ordained. But he's already moving in his unction. He's already holding the rope for Pastor G on the, on the ladder. He's already running behind Dick and Daryl trying to help him put up blinds. and try to, Why? Because your unction is manifested long before we give you a title. And what happens in church is when we give you a title, you stop functioning in your unction. And start only making your function what God wants. Well, I preach. That's nice. But that's, that, that, that's your function. Well I, well, I usher. That's great. That's your function. Well, I count the money and I go to the bank. Great. That's your function. That's your reasonable service to the house of God. Because you're saved. But what is your unction? quiet and watch this so when the man came back to check on the talents the one that had five came and brought five more see because when you start sensing your unction you start developing it and cultivating it it multiplies multiplies. I know that my unction is teaching on Holy Spirit, but I didn't know it was teaching online to thousands of people every day. But it kept multiplying. It keeps multiplying. And now, Instagram, now, free conference, believe it or not, still 20 or 30 people so on, on, on the phone call every day. And then Facebook live. We see about a thousand in the morning and by evening it's another three, four thousand. Why? Because the one talent is multiplying. It's multiplying. And then you get called to different places. I want you to come teach Holy Spirit. I want you to teach Holy Spirit. I want you to teach Holy Spirit to my church. I want to do a school of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because now that talent is multiplying. Now imagine if you got five of those. It's multiplying. Each one is multiplying. Your talent, see your function doesn't multiply. Who is quiet? Function doesn't multiply. But your unction multiplies. It keeps multiplying. It keeps growing. It keeps expanding. And you know what happens while you're doing that? You're growing. You're developing. You're maturing. You develop people skills. You develop nice skills. You develop timeliness and accountability. Because now your, your, your talent is making room for you. In this place, your function doesn't make room, your gift makes room. But you're gonna, it's gonna cost you some time. And what we want to do, we want to give you our function and we out. Don't call me until it's time for me to function again. Don't call me. No, -uh. no, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna do this, and that's all I'm gonna do because you really don't want to put no time into this, and that's why the church. The shelves the bear because you don't want to put time in it. You don't want to put no time in your unction. You don't want to put time in the house. It, it's going to call for an investiture. You're going to have to be invested. And now that it's 120, 
You got to do it. It ain't 3,000, now it's 120. Now you got to come through for real. You got to show up, you got to invest, you got to put time in it, and you got to watch it multiply. And you got to motivate yourself. And you got to get the skills. Now, I'm going to train you. I'm going to equip you to do it. But if you continue to do it right, it's going to keep growing and it's going to require more of you. I cannot tell you how many books I've read on the Holy Spirit. And how many more books I got to read. But I got to invest. I got to get up every morning. I got to do it. People say, I don't know how you do it. It's my unction. How many of y'all hear what I'm saying? Is this helping you at all? This little book is going to help you. If you don't cheat, it's going to help you. If you cheat, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to screw you up. You're going to get screwed. Because I'm going to be asking you to produce what, you, what this book says. Hello, somebody. Now, the five multiplied what? Five more. The two did what? Multiplied two more. And the one did what? That's why he got one. He got one because he was constantly tired, constantly unavailable, constantly working his job. Oh, y'all kill me with these jobs. You do more for your job than you do for your church. You should repent. You should repent. They'll fling you out there and swing you out there for a few dollars. And you'll go and you'll do it and you'll work. And you won't complain. And they don't never use any of your talent. It's just pay, pay, pay per view. But you don't have any of that for your church. Any of that vibrato. All that aggression, all that, all that you want to do at your job to get affirmed and promoted. Why don't you do that for the house of God? Why don't you have that same get up and go? You go in the sleet, the storm, the rain. You don't even like it sometimes. You don't get treated fair. You're not always affirmed and celebrated, but you go. Sometimes you go for years. Oh, but my God, even if you fall out, you go. Mad, you're just typing at the computer, you're just mad. You don't like your supervisors, you don't like your coworkers, but you go. But you won't do that for your church. You won't do that in the house of God. You won't put that same work to it, that same passion, that same intentionality. Imagine what 120 committed and invested, gifted people will do in one year. But it starts with you. I say it starts with you. It's quiet now. It starts with you. Now, what does that mean? It means I got to change, got to change some stuff. I got to change the way I see the church. I was talking to Pastor Shannon last night. I said, oh, we will have church on Christmas. And we will have church on New Year's Eve. And we will have church on New Year's Day. If there's anything I hate, it's a weak church. So we gotta, I got to kill this spirit that has seeped into this house. I got to kill it in the leadership. I got to kill it in this church. Why wouldn't we have church on Easter, on, on, on Easter, or Christmas, or New Year? Why wouldn't we? So you can be at home with your family? That ain't their birthday. All ain't saying nothing. And some of you jokers already got it in your mind. Well, I don't know what we're doing for Christmas. But I ain't coming. I don't know what we're doing for New Year's Eve. I don't know if I'm coming. If I come for New Year's Eve, I ain't gonna come for New Year's Day. That's how we be, that's how we treat this. 
But let them call you in to work. Let them call you in to work. You'll work New Year's. You'll work Christmas, Easter. You'll work, in, you'll, you'll work. You know why? Because you're getting validated by money. Child, we're going to get triple time. If I go in there, yes, Lord. But I wouldn't do it for church. So something has happened here that has seduced us to complacency. Pastor Shannon preached a message on mediocrity. We will never be a mediocre church as long as I breathe. We will be proactive. I'm not giving you jokers no time off. You had two and a half years off. Look at my face and think and if you think I'm playing. I'm not giving you jokers no more time off. You'd have had two whole years off from Bible study. And you won't even get on the phone. Because a spirit of seduction has hit us. We can't do that like this. We can't go out like that. Not the cathedral. I want you to take two minutes. I'm going to ask you a question. And I want ten people to grab a mic. You grab a mic, and I want you to tell me what problem have you been born to solve in this house. Ten people should be jumping up already, grabbing a mic. I got one. Now, why is there a delay? Because we don't know. Look, look at me. We don't know. You know why? Because we ain't never thought about it. We're just so comfortable trying to come and get the word and go home. But we got to fill the cabinets and the rooms with treasures. Because the people will come. I can get them in, but I can't keep them in. I'm kind of like God. I can create the culture and the context. I can get them through the door. But I'm going to need you. To put the ministries and the operations in place that they come and stay. Because after their, the honeymoon, after they get filled with the Holy Ghost and they start learning about the Holy Spirit, they're going to start looking for men's ministry. They're going to start looking for children's ministry. They're going to start looking for young adult ministry. They're going to start looking for these things. And if those things are not in place, as strong of an experience as they've had, they will walk out that door. I can get them in the door, but I can't keep them. You got to keep them. And you know how you're going to keep them? Raise your little blue book up. Raise it up. Raise it up high. Look at, look at you. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. <laughs> these, these gifts will keep them in this house. Sister darling, you got the mic? Number one, go. What problem have you been born to solve? Okay. Wow, that's good. All right, all right. Anybody else? I'm, I, I said 10 people. That was one. Where's the other nine? She the only one? Look at that. Wow. Come on, you gotta get a, come over here and get a mic. Come around and get the mic. All right, Sister Veronica. What problem were you born to solve? I don't know if it, I was born to solve this problem, but this is something that I've been concerned about ever since I first came to this church, and I just didn't want to take responsibility, just being honest. Okay. But I think women take care, women are nurturers and they take care of people, and I think that, I know that our church depends on our tithes, so when we die, our tithes die with us, and I always believe that we should have women in the church at least have a $10,000 policy, so when we die, our church can at least get 10000 If you can afford more, then I think that you should pay more, but I don't really know how to get the group together to do it, but that's something that I always wanted to do. Praise God. That's called endowment. 
That's called endowment. She wants to take care of the financial needs of the church so that after you die, the church does not die with it. If you go downtown and around the city, thousands of churches in this town have no people in it, but people died and endowed their church through insurance policies so that when they died, they left for millions of dollars so the church is still able to function without people. All right? Yes, Sister Annie? Yes. I believe we really need a an accessory prayer. No, not we. No, no, no. Me. Don't tell me church. what we need. Well, what you. problem have I you been born problem. to solve? Okay, my problem is. See, because that's what we do. Yeah. We, we need this. <laughs> oh, we do? Go. But what we do, huh? What I'm, uh, who going to do, do it? Who going to do it? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Okay. <laughs> Start over. Yes. What I was concerned in the problem that I see is real true in accessory prayer. Okay. Amen. That when we get, I get together or when I form this group, mm -hmm. that we can be able to reach so many that when they come in, they will get delivered. Mm -hmm. They will get laid, hands laid on. They will be able to walk out delivered. Okay. All right. I'm going to look to see it. All right. Sister Tanya. Families, um, mediation, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. bringing wholeness or bringing back relationship to families that maybe have, um, have had challenges. Sounds, sounds like a Christian counseling department to me. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. I love it. All right. Sister Rhonda. Good morning. Um, I am designed to help the people in the house. Okay. I build the house and the surrounding communities and strengthen it. Um, helping, you know, with whatever the house needs. So if there's a need for food or care or stuff mm -hmm. like that, I mm -hmm. help. Uh, in everything that they need. Uh, I am a good resource person if they're having mm -hmm. difficulties mm -hmm. with certain things. I, I'm just wow. have a whole lot of resources in. Okay, wow. That's triage and, and, and outreach. That sounds good. Hey Amen. I'm right, here. Pastor. I'm here representing Dante. I'm going to oh. be his mouthpiece. All right. He said he wants to create a ministry where it help the young people learn how to put salt out on the on the grounds and just help the elderly people getting from the car to the church yes. and everything else. So he wants to create that. So I am his mouthpiece. All right. All right. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, Amen. while you got the mic, go ahead and tell me what problem you born to solve. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to solve the problem of Christian education. Okay. Absolutely. And, um, even, I sense even more so now, helping our children get to college. Amen. Not just be educated the theologically, but to have something so that you can you can strive and thrive and have a good earning for your family. I just it just came to me not only Christian education but getting our people into college. Education, Amen. education, Amen. all Amen. all aspects. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That's that's what I'm gonna do. All right, all right, all right. Here come the Robinsons. Praise the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, my wife and I we've been married for 23 years. Uh, we've been in a relationship for a little over 25 years. Wow. And I think uh, we've been called to help marriage couples. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I mean, our, our marriage hasn't been perfect, but I think we have a lot of experience and, you know, things that has happened that we can be a help to uh, marriage couples. Praise God. Absolutely. 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 Amen. Sister Tracy. Um, um, of course, um, you said function and unction. I know that we have been called for marriage. Um, as he said, our marriage hasn't been perfect, but we're perfect for one another. And we want to, it has always bothered me, especially this year, is to uh, talk about why did we get married and how to stay married. Wow. We have so many couples that have divorced. That, you know, Child, I'm going to be in that class. <laughs> <laughs> the, our, divorce, no, so. <laughs> our divorce rate is just so high, yeah. especially among Christians. And so we know that's not what God called us to do is to be divorced. We want to stay married. We want to, if we stay married, we can keep families. Yes. And once you're divorced, the, the family falls apart. And yes. that's not what God has. And it falls and that, apart in the church. Yes, and it falls apart in the church. Absolutely. And so um, if you will allow us, um, we believe that's what we've been called into Absolutely. for this time. Absolutely. And this hour. Absolutely. And so, 
Absolutely. When y'all fit, 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 fit this little blue out, yes, that's going to be good in the unction area because we need that very strongly. All right, Sister Erica. Um, compassion for people. Um, for somebody, how, if they need to talk to somebody, somebody to just listen to them. Um, I noticed that when visitors or new members come, someone to check up on them to see how they are wow. doing yes. and yes. why well, haven't they been back and yes. what are they lacking or what do they need? Yes, wow, absolutely. New member follow-up, all right, all right. Chief? In addition to everything I already do, <laughs> one thing I want, would like to do is put my military skills to use. For young people, for parents who may be having difficulty with their young people, uh, you can bring them to Camp April, All right. and I can help them get their minds together. Yeah, get their minds together. Hallelujah. <laughs> get their minds together, baby. Brother Will, Pastor Will. I'd like to know, do we have an evangelism team here? I'm sorry, one more. Do we have an evangelism team here? No, not now. Not currently. Okay, well, I would like to start an evangelism team. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been trained. I'm going to read up on some more how to do it. All right. Woo, hallelujah. He said, I'm going to do it and train you. All right. Somebody praise God for this. Come on, church. Come on. Somebody say, small is the next big. All right. Come on, Pastor Vanessa. Um, so I was sitting there, and April had looked back at me like, you know, what are you? And so just in the midst of it all, just thinking, I know that my passion is for people to read, to learn how to read. So establishing that, and even when you passed out the book, there may be some people in here that may not understand or how to comprehend. Comprehend, you know. I want to make myself available if you need me to sit down and help you with that um, that assessment. Wow. So I know wow. that I'm, you know, my passion, my unction is reading, you know, and helping parents, helping students, helping adults with reading. All so, right. all right, all right, <laughs> you got you got you got one right now, right now. <laughs> All right, this is so good. How many of you are enjoying this? Stand up on your feet. Praise God. This is where we're going for the next few months. I'm going to ask uh, those, Pastor Val, if the communion table is ready. I want us to get ready to take the Lord's table together. And one of the things that I believe is necessary at this season, yes, we need deacons. Yes, we need leaders in the house. Yes, those are functions. Sister Kirkland has been serving at the door for many, many years. And I thank God for her function. Thank God for her serving in the winter seasons of her life, the stormy season. She's been on that door. So we praise God. But how many of you know we need more people who will work in the house as well in the area of hospitality in terms of functioning, ushers, trustees, deacons, all of those things are always needed. But I don't want us to be title heavy in this new season. I want us to be in our unctions. And I don't want you to think, well, okay, because that's what I do, that I necessarily need a title. I, I, don't, I want us to get away from some of that. And let's just do the work. Let's do the work, amen? I want to see a counseling office. I want to, you know, see a, 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 a call center. I want new members to be followed up. Those things should come naturally because it's your unction, it's your gift. And if we have any visitors today, I certainly hope that while you are here with us today, that you have heard something that would make you want to be a part of our church. That we are in the reset mode. We're in re that hitting that reset button. That we have gone, you know, somewhat down in terms of passion and energy and commitment. The pandemic did that to us but I believe that this is the right moment for us to recalibrate to get into a place where we recalibrate this house I'm not just going for every seat full but I am going for 120 strong 120 strong I'm going to say it until I get five amens that we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit together that we are engaged. Church, we've got to get engaged. I need you to realize that you can never build a great house 
if all the talents, the gifts, the tools are not functioning at the optimum level. I've never been interested in numbers. I've been before thousands, even probably millions. But that, that's not what I want. I want people that love God. Do you love Jesus? Are you in love with Jesus? And if you love Jesus, you got to love his church. You got to love his house. And you can't just function. You've got to get invested. 2023, I'm not asking you to put in 40 hours like you do your job, but I am telling you it's going to take more than two or three hours. Not just for service, but to come to the house to get done what needs to get done. Our offices are going to reopen in January. We're going to be able to be on deck at least three days a week. That we're coming out of this pandemic, we got to reset and recalibrate. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And I've gone soft over the last couple of years because I knew the trauma and I didn't want to argue. I came sick. I came to church with COVID. I preached with COVID because I'm invested. That wasn't a sacrifice for me. I want you to understand that's not a sacrifice. And when my children said, Ma, please stay home, I said, if you make me stay home, I'll die. I came every Sunday with COVID and God was faithful. I would be so sick. But I was able to share the word and go home and go back to bed. And nobody caught it from me. That's the goodness of the Lord. And I'm not saying that that's what everybody should do. I'm talking about me and my investment. But if you just treat this church like, oh, we just go there on Sunday. And oh, we just, you know, we have a good time. You, you're not invested. You like the product, but you're not buying stock. It's different than just going to the mall and liking a certain brand and you buying stock in that brand. You're invested. Other than that, you're just a consumer. So, you know, you like, you like whatever you like, whether it's Target, Target, whatever y'all call it, you like all of that. But do you have any stock? Then you're not invested in that company. You only are a consumer. You can't be a consumer at the cathedral. I'm asking you in 2023 to invest, to buy stock. I'm gonna build this, if I don't do anything but build one row, I'm gonna build it. I'm going to build whatever is in my heart, I'm gonna build it. And nobody will have to come and ask me, how's it going? They're gonna see it. I want us to move from consumerism to investors that you hold stock in this brand and that when you see that something is going well you buy more stock you get more involved when we see our stocks doing well we buy more I'm going to ask you this year after 50 years I believe our stock is good I said, I believe our stock is good. I believe that we have residual results. I believe that we can look all over the world and see the results of this house. I'm not asking you for membership this year. I'm asking you to become an investor. Invest your time. Invest your talent. And invest your treasure. For 39, 49 years, I've been able to support this house financially. God has blessed me to go and travel around the world and bring my money and give it to the finance department to take care of this house. I want you to relieve me of that. I want you to take that burden off of me. I want you to be as committed financially to this house as I am. That whatever this house needs, that you stop spending in your life to take care of this house. That you stop buying things you, you frivolously don't need and you start investing in this house. 
that you don't wait for Deacon Russ to get up on a ladder and put the light in. But you see a light is out and you say, you know what? We need to get together, brother, and let's get these lights on. I'm asking you to change your mind and shift your thinking from just your function to your unction. And if you're here today and you say, you know what? This is the kind of church I want to be a part of. Then I'm going to ask you in your heart to say, Lord, I want to be a part of this. I want to be involved in this next move. I want to be engaged in this. And give me the motivation. Give me the spiritual momentum that I need. That I don't need external stimulation. But I move from the inside. Let me be passionate about the house. Passionate about the message. Let me become passionate about my brand. This is our brand. Let me be passionate about it. And let me be able to see in one year a change, a shift because of what my unction is going to produce. Not what Bishop is going to do, but what I'm going to do. And as you get ready to come to the table, I want that to be in your heart. I want that to be in your mind. That I'm not just taking communion with the body of Christ, but I'm taking communion with this house. And in this house, I'm going to be invested investing my time, my treasure, my talent. If I got to read a book, if I've got to give some more time, whatever I need to do, I need to do that. That this house will be exactly what God wants it to be. So Father, we thank you right now for every part of this ministry. Things that have died that don't need to come back online, then we thank you. But for every new space, for every new part of the vision, and needs to come back Lord we thank you that the results shall make proof full proof and we also thank you Father that the solutions are in these seats today as we come to this table Lord let us be mindful that this body and this blood has been shed for people and that this people is called the Holy Ghost Cathedral and that this house shall continue to make an impact in the world. Change our thinking, our timelines, change our attitudes, change us, Lord, from the inside out. Whatever we picked up in these last three years that has distracted us, I pray that as we come to the table today, that God, something will happen on the inside of us. That something will happen in our hearts. That something will happen that we're not going to just take it and consume. But God is going to trigger an investment from us. Holy Spirit, show us individually what our unction is. And how you have placed it in us that it might multiply. I thank you. I give you praise. I give you glory that you are working this out for our good. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. I bless this bread and bless this wine in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that even now, God, there is a stirring in our spirit. There's a stirring in our spirit that we are going to be all right in Jesus' name. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. of the wine in which we serve, which has been
blessed and prayed over. And for those of you that desire the portables, for whatever the reason, you have the options. I'm going to ask that you would serve yourself. If you desire, I'm going to give you the body of the blood of Jesus. I was lost. Jesus died on the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Oh, I know it was the blood. Virchelle, get that mic. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. For me.
I know it was the blood. It was my Savior's blood. Come on, honey, you know it, you know it, you know it, you know it. It was not shed for us to fail, but for us to succeed. One day when we was lost, he died upon that cross. Oh, yes. 
already given. If you have not, please do so now. Please, before you leave, make sure that your tithes or offerings are on the altar. Please do that now. The trustees are on duty. If you're giving by cash app, please put that up on the screen for me, please. If you're giving by cash app, dollar sign HDFG Cathedral. If you're giving by PayPal, paypal.me, HG Cathedral. If you're going to our website, www.gotellit.org, forward slash donate. If you are mailing in your gifts, 1745 East Grand Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan, 48211. For God loves a cheerful giver. Let us give today. Let us give out. Let us give out. Let's put that sacrifice in there. Also, today is the first Sunday, which is Episcopal Sunday. Don't forget your shepherd. In your giving, your tithes, your offering on the first Sunday and your Episcopal offering. Your $77, $77 miracle seed. That's dollar sign, Carletta Vaughn. Or you can give it here, right here in this altar by writing a check praise God amen do it now do not leave without giving especially your Episcopal offering your tithes and your offerings are needed to support the house we love you so much thank you for being here this is only week one week two week three let's end week four with 120 people in the room amen God bless have a super day
Change the atmosphere. 